Hi, everybody. All nine of you so far. I have a cold, so my voice will crack a little bit, but we'll survive. I have tea. I'd offer you some, but it would be a little hard right now. Let's see what we have for questions. Mackenzie, how you doing? I'd like to be able to talk to you, but all I can do is answer your question, which is looking forward to chatting with you. Uh, Andrew is ready. He's here. Savvy Bookworm says hi. Mike Malley, or Maley, nice to be here. Shelly Mead wants to know, hi Shelly, do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Um, wow, we're starting with the toughest question of all. Here's my advice to aspiring writers. Tell a story. It seems so simple, and yet it's the most important and most challenging thing that we do every day. Because telling a story is what so many times when we go wrong, that's what we lose track of. And when I say a story, I mean something that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you need to be able to identify those three things. And you need to identify the transitions between those three, the beginning, the middle, and then where's the climax? Where does it come? Beyond that, I go to what John, the great John D. McDonald said when he was asked to define what a story is. And John D. McDonald, who created the Travis McGee series, said story is stuff happening to people you care about. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of creating characters that the audience likes and roots for. Because if you don't root for the characters, nothing else matters. If you don't care about, if you're not invested emotionally in the characters, nothing else matters. It's the most important thing of all. You can have a great plot, but if you don't care about the people, the plot fails. Uh, I also go by the by the theory, not even a theory, the practice, that you should write what you would read if someone else had written it. You can only, I, I, I love when I'm talking to writers or, or would-be writers, and they want to know what they should write. And I ask them, what do you read? And they go, well, I don't read. Well, if you don't read, you can't write. There's no, those two things are intrinsically connected. So you look at your at what you're doing when you read, and that will tell you what to do when you write. I started out, for example, by imitating my favorite authors. Robert Ludlum, Stephen King, Clive Cussler, David Morrell. We all start by imitating. Victor Hugo, the author of Les Miserables, wrote that good writers borrow and great writers steal. And let me tell you, I've stolen more and I steal better than anybody and I'm still stealing today. Let's see, we have another question now. We have Andrew, Andrew Mazie or Mozzie, what or who inspires you to write? Well, Mike, first off, I love the process. I love to write. I, I'm a storyteller. It's part of me. It's like therapy. When I'm not writing, it's like with, I, I go through what feels like withdrawal from drugs. Um, and when I am writing, no matter what else is going on in my life, when I sit down behind the computer to work, it all goes away. And I disappear into the world that I'm creating for the reader. I disappear into the world that I'm trying to suck you into. So in essence, I'm the first person who gets sucked into my own world, which to me is what, I, you know, is that what inspires me? In large part, yes. But the other thing that inspires me is the fact that I have bills to pay. So I once answered this question very recently by saying, what inspires me? Nothing. <laughs> because if you wait for inspiration, you may be waiting a long time. Writing is a job. You get up and you do it every day because it's what you do and it's what pays the bills. And then when you lose sight of that, when you start to think that you what you do is bigger than what everybody else does, you're lost. Because 
A doctor gets up. He doesn't wait to be inspired. A lawyer gets up, a cop, a teacher, a bus driver. Everybody gets up in the morning and they don't wait to be inspired. They go to work. And if you're lucky enough to be making a living at what you love to do, if you're lucky enough, you know, Andrew, to, to, to be doing something that you honestly look forward to every day, that's what inspires you. What inspires you, or should inspire you anyway, is the ability to be so fortunate that you are doing what you love because so few people who work in even this great country can honestly say they love what they do, which is unfortunate. So Andrew, I hope that answered your question. Hit me with another one if it didn't. Let's see what we have from Savvy Bookworm. Savvy Bookworm wants to know, are any of your characters based on real people you have met? That's a real, that, that is a terrific question. And the answer really is no. Most writers would probably say yes, but I don't find inspiration necessarily in real people. What I find is bits and pieces of real people um, who, you know, who I put together. It's kind of a homogenization of different parts of people I've met. Let me give you an example. In Strong Vengeance, I was aware, I knew that there was a Texas billionaire um, who was spending a fortune on supporting Rick Perry for president because Rick Perry had promised to relax all the EPA standards. Why was this important to this Texas billionaire, who I believe his name is Hawkins? Because he wanted to, to train and truck nuclear waste into West Texas to store it. So of course he had an agenda. I used him as the basis for my character. This is in a book called Strong Vengeance. I used him as the basis for the Tiafilo Car Braga character, who was a waste management ma management baron, who is essentially doing the same thing that Hawkins does. And of course, homegrown Islamic terrorists then try to steal the nuclear waste he's stockpiled to make a dirty bomb, the ultimate dirty bomb. So in that sense, I was inspired by someone who was real, but I can't say that Hawkins and Braga were even close to the same person. Not even close. We have another question. We have a couple. We have, here's a good one from Jagged Otter. Which one of your books would you like produced into a feature film and why? What a great question. How about any of them as long as it pays? That would be my first thought. You know, um, when I think about Pandora, which is the latest one, I would love to see Pandora's Temple developed into a movie because it's the kind of movie I would love. I grew up on the old James Bond movies with Sean Connery, Goldfinger, Thunderball, From Russia with Love, Dr. No. That's the tradition of Pandora's Temple. Big scale, over the top action with scenes, each action scene, it's like I'm playing the game can you top this? I would love to see how that vision gets realized on screen. I would love to see how closely the character I've created in Blaine McCracken, how closely he would be played to my vision. Would he be the same person? Or would they do to Blaine McCracken what got done to Dirk Pitt? in Sahara when they cast Matthew McConaughey. But here's the thing, Jag Daughter. Once you sell the book and take the money, don't complain. If you care so deeply about the integrity of your art and your book that you don't want them to mess with it, don't sell it because they're going to mess with it. They're going to hire the best actor they can get and they're going to do what's best for the movie not necessarily what's best for the book. I get such a kick out of the fact of authors like Tom Clancy taking out full page ads in newspapers all across the country, complaining that Harrison Ford was too old to play Jack Ryan. <clears throat> Anne Rice did the same thing when Tom Cruise was cast 
as Lestat. To his credit, Lee Child, a good friend of mine who created the wonderful character Jack Reacher, never complained when Tom Cruise cast himself as Reacher, even though he seemed like the absolute worst actor for the role. Lee never complained and will tell you to this day right now that this movie, which, which is going to be out in a few weeks, is a good film. Is it the Reacher he created? Not exactly. But far more people will see the movie than have ever read a Reacher book. We have a question from my friends at Book Trip. What was the biggest challenge starting to write about Blaine again? What a good question. Let's start with the fact that I stopped writing McCracken in 1999, 98, around there. He was a Vietnam veteran who has cut his teeth in the Phoenix Project, um, which was in the early 70s, late 60s. Well, I couldn't keep McCracken at 45. I couldn't do what Robert Parker did to Spencer. Robert Parker, in an early book, makes Spencer a Korean War vet. That means Spencer is 88 years old today. I didn't want to do that with McCracken. I didn't want to cheat. McCracken, I knew, was going to turn 60 in this book. That's his age. That's his real life age in the chronology that I've given him. The biggest challenge, initially, was dealing with the fact that I had a geriatric hero, a 60-year-old hero. The challenge was, how can a 60-year-old man do all the things an action novel, a thriller like Pandora's Temple, require him to do? Well, I kind of got away from that concern when I started to look at this book and that plight, McCracken's plight of turning 60, as a metaphor for what's happening to so many people that age in this economy today. So many people who are still young, 60 is the new 40, that's what I say, still young, still vital, losing their jobs, and no one's hiring a 60-year-old guy. When Pandora's Temple opens, the phone has stopped ringing for Blaine McCracken. No one's calling anymore. Younger people are getting those jobs. It seems like time has passed McCracken by. Part of the fun of the book that started out as a challenge is watching McCracken come to grips with exactly who he has always been and always will be and learn to deal with the physical challenges of being 60 years old. Now, here's the good thing to tie in the last two questions. There are a bunch of terrific action heroes who are now this age. So another reason why it's, it's funny but we're going to get to this maybe later. But to give you a little hint on where we might be going with this before the end of the show, the actor I always wanted to play McCracken since I created him in 1986 is still the actor I would like to see play McCracken today. And isn't that something? And maybe I'll get that chance. We have another question from, ah, from Mackenzie. Uh, well, it's Mackenzie M., but I'm guessing the name is Mackenzie. Um, and this is the same question we had before. Do you base your characters off people that you, kn that you know? Let me answer that question a different way. Everyone I meet, everyone who, who moves me in some way, goes into a filing cabinet in, in my head. And I'm not aware of all the things that I store. So I guess the best answer to that question is yes, but not always consciously. Sometimes it happens at the subconscious level. Now, I will tell you this to digress. Um, not in Pandora's Temple, but in my next Caitlin Strong Texas Ranger novel, which is called Strong Rain Fog, it will be out in August, fifth in the series. I set, I wanted to do a scene, an action scene at something we have here in Providence, Rhode Island called Water Fire. That allowed me, I needed a reason to move, a to have a Texas Ranger in Providence, and that allowed me to use 
the head coach of the Brown University football team, as a character in the book, who's a big fan of the Caitlin Strong books and a great friend of mine and a man I respect tremendously, Coach Phil Estes of the Brown Bears. So it's the first time I've actually ever done that, but I had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, but I digress. Let's get back to Blaine McCracken and let's get back to Pandora's Temple. Who would you want to see? This is from Andrew. Andrew Maisie or Mozzie. Who would you want to see play Blaine McCracken in a movie? Well, I, I, I think we have some kind of contest about that. Um, but I would say, I'm, I'm going to give you a hint. I'm going to give you a hint. He's already played a character. And I'm, if you're listening in, see if you can guess. He's already played a character who's appeared in three films. His fourth one is coming out for Christmas. If you know that actor and you know the character he's played before, I think you'll agree with me that he'd be perfect to play the wisecracking hero, Blaine McCracken. And like Blaine McCracken, this character uses sense of humor as a defense mechanism. It's how he deals with the violence. And I promise you, before the end of this broadcast, before the end of this show, we will reveal this person if you haven't guessed him already. Savvy Bookworm is back with us. Do you have plans to bring back McCracken for another book after Pandora's Temple? Wow. I can't say I have a plot yet, but yes, I do have plans. And here's the reason. I have an incredibly supportive publisher of this book in Open Road Integrated Media. Uh, they had published 13 of my titles, that five of which were McCracken books, that had been out of print for 20 years. And they reinvigorated the thirst for McCracken. They reinvigorated the interest in McCracken. So depending on how Pandora's Temple does, because let's face it, if it sells four copies, chances are I won't be doing another one. But if it sells 400,000 or 40,000, you bet I will. Um, people could say, well, you're, what does that make me? Because I'm basing decisions, creative decisions, on financial, uh, on sales figures. Well, that's reality. You don't make a car that nobody buys. And you don't write a book. You don't write a sequel to a book that doesn't do well. But that's not going to happen. I fully expect that people who used to read McCracken are going to embrace him again. And I feel that people who have never met him are going to embrace him for the first time. Because there is something about McCracken. He is the classic American hero. He is the loner. He is the, he is the gunfighter who rides in out of the wilderness, out of the desert, to save the innocent people in the town from the terrible villain. And when his quest is over, he rides off again. Great character, but also some amazing action scenes in Pandora's Temple. And more to the point, I love working with the myth of Pandora's box, which was actually a jar. I love exploring the reality behind the mythology. What, I, what, what my good friend Steve Barry, my friend Steve Barry and Jim Rollins call speculative history. Using something that's legend or folklore to base your thriller around. And no one has ever used Pandora's box slash jar before. What if it was real? And that's where this book takes off. So a long answer to the question to Savvy Bookworm, if what I, de what I need more than anything is another idea as good as Pandora's Temple, an idea that's worthy of the scope of the McCracken character and the books in the past. Because I never want to write a book that's just only as good. I want to write a book that's better. Let's move on. Mackenzie's back with a terrific question. Do you have any writing rituals? Music in the background, hot beverage, snacks, silence. What a great question. Let me give you two of my rituals. And if you're still on with us, um, the, the person who asked me 
about advice for writers, for, for, for beginning writers. Here's more advice. Two things. One, I always have a book by one of my favorite authors in reserve. James Lee Burke, Lee Child, David Morrell, Steve Berry, James Rollins. I save it. I don't read it when it first comes out. Why? Because to find the mindset I need to write before I start my, my, my session in the morning and at night, because I write in two different sessions, morning or, or afternoon, say 11 to 2, something like that, and then again from around 8 to 11 in that area, I read 15 or 20 pages. And that gets me in the mood. And that's so important. Because if you're in the mood, it's kind of like if you play basketball. You don't just go out and play the game. You take layups. You shoot free throws. You warm up. You, you, get, you, know, you get the sweat going. That's the equivalent of what I do with reading a little bit of my favorite authors before I start to write. Second thing I do, when I finish a writing session, I never leave off at the end of a chapter. I always at least start the next one, a couple paragraphs. Sometimes I'll even leave off in the middle of a sentence. Why? Because that way, when I sit down behind the computer the next day, I have a running start. I don't have to start from scratch again. And that's crucial. Because if you have to start from scratch all the time, it's going to be a very laborious process. Homer, I feel, the great poet Homer, with the Iliad and the Odyssey, created the first thriller ever. That was the first thriller. It was a quest story. All Ulysses wants to do is get home. That's it. That's his quest. Homer coined the phrase, immedius reus, start in the midst. Start every scene before something has happened or after something has happened, before something else is about to happen. And that's the two rituals I have. Speaking of thrillers, we have a question from Thriller Lover, 12, 30, 1, 2, 3, 1. Do you have a notebook where you store all your ideas? Have you ever got an idea from a crazy encounter or dream you've had? What a great question. No. Yes and no to the first part of the question. I don't have a notebook. Not a physical one. But my brain is like a sponge. I don't outline. I don't take notes. But when something impregnates itself on my brain, I can't let it go. I, I just, it gets a hold of me like, like, like a lobster claw on my finger. And I know it's going to stay because that's, and I would, I'm not sure that's always ideas because a lot of times, you know, if you, one of the, one of the, one of the things I recommend to all thriller writers, read the New York times every day. You will find more research tools by reading the New York Times than anything else you will do besides learning, becoming a master a master of Google, which is also a crucial research term. I can't tell you how many ideas I've gotten from, from newspaper articles that I've clipped from the New York Times. You can do the same thing with Scientific American. You can do it with Time Magazine. You can do it with websites. You can do it with anything. So I don't really make notes but I do take, I do amass huge stacks of clippings that I often have to funnel through to find what I remember I have, but don't remember where I put it. But if I want to use a scene or if I want to use some information, it becomes crucial. Um, I live in my head, I guess, is the point I'm making, Thriller Lover. And I never want to make writing something that is that is work. I know that sounds crazy, but as soon as you start carrying around notebooks and you're always making notes and you're, you know, I see people doing this all the time, it becomes work. Remember what I said early on to someone, be a storyteller. Be someone who first and foremost is keeping you turning the pages. From scene to scene, chapter to chapter, you can, the greatest compliment I can be given is, I couldn't put your book down. And that's what I strive for. Mike Maley has another question. 
Do you find the act of writing is getting easier or harder as time goes by? That is the $64,000 question. I've never been asked that before. I'm going to sip some tea while I plan my answer. You know, honestly, I'd have to say it's, it's gotten a lot easier. And the reason for that is confidence. To a couple of different reasons. Let me give you several reasons, Mike. Why? Obviously, after 32 books, I'm pretty confident in myself now. Confident enough to know that I don't need to outline. Because I trust my characters. I write from the inside out. I don't write from the outside looking in. Every scene you will read in Pandora's Temple, for example, is written from a character's viewpoint. The omniscient narrator never appears. It's always what someone is seeing. The greatest advice I have been given as a writer in the past decade came from my editor, the great Natalia Aponte, who told me that when writing a scene, always know where the light is coming from. Because if you know where the light is coming from, you'll everything else you describe in that scene will be easy. But most important, this goes back to what I just said. You need to trust your characters and get out of the way. I tr strive to let my characters tell me where they want to go. And that's the great thing. When To go back to the question about what was the biggest challenge about bringing Blaine McCracken back after so long. Well, I had to recapture not just how he thinks, but the how he interacts with the other characters in the series and the other people that he meets. That took a little bit of time. But I knew if I stuck with it, it would come back. It's like anything else. When you haven't done something for a while, it's not going to be there right away. But if you're patient, it will come. And that's what happened with this book. Because I trusted more in McCracken than I even trusted in myself. You know, which, which was really something special. So hopefully that answers the question. Let's move on. Jagged Otter has another question. Have you ever started to write a book and then tossed out the idea? Wow. We're, I'll tell you something. We're getting some great questions tonight. The answer, um, I, you know, I can't think of one, believe it or not, offhand. Because I live with the ideas, the concept, the big, I, the big MacGuffins, the big jobs, the things that drive my books. I live with them for months, if not years, before I put pen to paper. I'm very passionate about what I do. Now, example, for in Pandora's Temple, the big thing out there, yes, Pandora's box plays a huge role, but the real MacGuffin is dark matter, this mysterious force in the universe, both the most mysterious and potentially the most destructive. Dark matter was or hasn't been seen or identified since the Big Bang Theory. That's what created the universe. Or it was created in the Big Bang. It's out there. Nobody knows where. Nobody knows how to identify it or, or find it. So I had this concept for a long time of doing a book about dark matter. But I had gotten away from this kind of book. And when I decided it was time to bring McCracken back, dark matter became the obvious thing to make it to make it work so you know I don't throw away ideas because if I for me to throw them away would be to say I wasted a year of thought I wasted a year of development throwing it away would happen much earlier in the process long before I put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard sipping more tea now Let's go to another question from Savvy Bookworm is back. Do you have a, a favorite of the characters that you've created? You know what? Every question gets better than the one before. Keep them coming. That's just wonderful. I'm going to surprise you. Do I love McCracken? Yes. Do I love Caitlin Strong? 
my female Texas Ranger, yes. But you know what? When I read books, I my favorite characters, although I love the heroes I, of the books I read, I tend to like the right hand. I, I like the second bananas, the right hand men. Cleet Purcell in the great Dave Roby show novels by James Lee Burke. Spence, Spencer's right hand man, Hawk, in the Spencer series created by Robert Parker, to the point where if you pick up a Robert Parker book or a, a James Lee Burke book that doesn't have either Cleet Purcell or Hawk in them, you, I find myself exceptionally disappointed. So I find myself gravitating toward characters like Johnny War Eagle in Pandora's Temple. He doesn't have as much screen time as Blaine McCracken, but he always has the answers. And he's so much fun to write. And in the Caitlin Strong series, I absolutely love the, the seven-foot Venezuelan assassin Guillermo Paz for the same reason. And in fact, that character, the Paz character from my Caitlin Strong books, wasn't supposed to survive the first book of the series, Strong Enough to Die. But he decided he had plans that were different for himself, that were different than mine. And there is no better feeling as a writer than when your characters begin to dictate the action for you. Nothing is more important and nothing is more fun. And in Pandora's Temple, that didn't happen right away. And But once it started to happen, once the characters started writing their own dialogue again, once McCracken told me where he wanted to go in this book, I fell in love with him all over again. And, you know, I was able to just pick up pretty much where I left off the writing, where I left off in Dead Simple, which many will tell you was the best book in the series, until Pandora, because I, I think Pandora, it may not, if it's not the best, it's the biggest. And I really look forward to those of you out there who have read McCracken. Write me after you read Pandora. Email me at johnlandbooks.com. Tell me what you think. Someone asked me before, am I going to bring him back? I want to hear from you about that. I want to know what you think I should do. Do you think McCracken is worth bringing back again? Tell me what you think of Pandora's Temple. Here is my nominee for best name of the night. This is Tiny Book Monkey. Hey, Tiny Book Monkey. How long does it take for you to write a novel, and what's the process like? It, I, I'm going to say something that will shock a lot of people. I do a first draft in about six or seven weeks. And that's crucial for me because I love to get it down. Getting it down creates an incredible sense of security. I will then work on additional three or four drafts depending on the book. And Pandora, I did five because it needed a, a little extra work. Um, and if it was... Um, so it's the seven week, six, seven week process to do a first draft, an additional four months or so to, to, to take the, crit, the constructive criticism of my editor and start to really rework scenes. Eliminate, quote, talking heads where people are talking but nothing is going on around them. Defining where's the emotion in the book. Defining where's the conflict in every single scene. And that's a, that's a necessity for me. Here's a very important thing in that regard. The writer who does not need an editor has lost his way because no writer ever gets it right on their own. You, have, you lose objectivity. You become subjective. You've got to have people who are willing to slap you upside the head and say, you need to do better here. The book is fine, but you need to do better in certain parts of the book. You need to make sense. There needs to be logic. You need to exp know why Why should I care about this character? What is his emotional quest or her emotional quest as well as their physical quest? What's going on in their lives? What is changing inside them? Those are all crucial questions that get answered not in the first draft but in the successive drafts at one after another. The first draft of Pandora's Temple did not contain 
what I feel is the most important moment in the book. When I went back and looked at it, I knew something was missing. My editor knew something was missing. It was there all along. I just didn't see it. And once I figured it out, it was a snap and the whole book fell together. But I didn't know that when I started. For me, writing a book is a process. The book evolves as I go. I don't write a 60 page outline. To me, that turns writing a book into a math formula where you're just plugging in pieces into a formula. That's not me. I write by the seat of my pants because if I don't know what's gonna happen next, how can you as the reader possibly know what's gonna happen next? And suspense and the suspense that creates is the most important thing in keeping you not only turning the pages in Pandora's temple, but in wanting to buy the next McCracken book, to read the next McCracken book as soon as you finish Pandora. We have another question from Thrill Lever 1231. If you weren't an author, what other profession would you consider tackling? Another great question. I went to Brown University. And I went to Brown not to be a writer, I went to Brown to be a lawyer. Law was as certain for me after college as college was after high school. Little did I know that I was going to fall in love with writing in college and abandon my goal of becoming a lawyer. That said, there are still times where, I, where I'm watching The Good Wife uh, on CBS on, on Sunday nights where I go, wow, I would have been so good at this. And even today, I love nothing more than being, being in a contentious situation and saying to someone who's across from me, okay, at, let me ask you a question. And basically, getting them to admit that they're wrong. So, for a lover, I, 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 would, be, I would be a lawyer. And I would probably enjoy it. But I'm not really mean. I'm not mean. And then, you know something? Here's the funny thing. I'm vice president of marketing, or I was. I just, my term just ended for a great organization called International Thriller Writers. And above everything else, I've learned being an active member and leader in ITW is what wonderful people writers are. Doug Preston, R.L. Stein, David Baldacci, Steve Berry. Jim Rollins, Vince Flynn, Lee Child. These aren't just my contemporaries. These aren't just my idols. These are my friends. And they're such wonderful people. Unlike any other, I'm sure there's a lot of nice people out there. But I got to tell you, writers aren't like any other celebrities I've ever met. They're real. They're down to earth. They care. They want to help. Shelly Mead has another question. Do you have any creative input when it comes to your book covers? Shelly, they don't tell me how to, the art department doesn't tell me how to write and I don't tell them how to design. That said, if you look at Pan, the cover for Pandora's Temple on the screen in front of you, that is an absolutely perfect cover because it captur, captures the mystery, the mysticism, the intrigue, and the wonder of what this book is all about. Because this book is asking a lot of questions. I'm doing things in Pandora's Temple that no one has ever done before. Not in any thriller I've ever read. Here's why. Nobody knows what dark matter can do. Nobody. So what I've created is my own paradigm. Based on research, of what I perceive dark matter being capable of. And that is what is captured so brilliantly in the cover of Pandora's Temple. You know, they say you can't judge a book by its cover. Maybe, but the best covers give you a sense of the book. The best covers capture the essence of what you're about to read. We have a very long question from my good friend Mackenzie. I wrote a book once. It was a collective effort, but now I want to write one on my own. How do you keep yourself on track? I feel like I have good ideas, but I get kind of scatterbrained or bored 
and feel like I won't finish it in a timely fashion. Help! Here's the way I look at it. If you could write five pages a day, five, five, that's it. And you wrote every, hey, let's not even say five, let's say two. And you wrote every day, you wrote for a year, you wrote two pages. At the end of that year, you'd have 700 pages, obviously. You're seeing my math here. Great math skills. That's why I'm an English major. The thing is, the thing that stops writers at any level from finishing is fear. You, you look across the table or you look down the road and you see after you've written the first 50 pages that you have 500 to go and you get scared. You have to look, Mackenzie, at writing a book is like a marathon. The marathon runner at mile one is not thinking of mile 26. The marathon runner at, mar at mile one is thinking of mile two. Every time I start a book, I'm terrified that it won't be long enough. That this is the book that instead of being 600 pages will end up being three. I've got this fear in me. And what keeps me going is I'm always thinking about the next 100 pages. I think in 100-page blocks. So basically what I'm doing is writing six 100-page books. Now, of course, <laughs> they're not separate. I don't mean to suggest that. What I'm saying is, in my mind, I get to page 50 and I go, wow, I got to 50. And then I got to page 100 and I go, what? The digits changed. We're in triple digits for the first time. So the key thing, Mackenzie, is to, is to celebrate smaller victories and never look past a foreseeable goal. Keep your eye on what's immediately in front of you. The next 25 pages, not the next 250. It's, you're still going to get to the same place, but you won't be nearly as scared and it will be much more fun. And that's the way I write to this day. And somehow, when I finish, there are always enough words and there are always enough pages. Let's see what Shelly has to say. She's back. What is your favorite holiday? <laughs> Do you have any big plans for Thanksgiving? You know... Thanksgiving, I think is it, it might be my favorite holiday because it isn't religious. And you see so many people inviting friends who might be alone, who, who might have nowhere to go. I mean, I'm a single guy. I don't have a big family. I've had like seven invitations to Thanksgiving this year. Now I'm going with my father um, and his and his wife to um, um, her, her, you know, her son's house. Um, and, and, you know, I, I guess like the in-laws and they're wonderful people. And I feel you should be with family for Thanksgiving, but there's something about Thanksgiving that's different than any other holiday. But I also like Christmas. Do you notice on Christmas how people let you in when you're trying to get, in, you pull out into traffic, how nobody cuts you off on the highway. That's a really nice thing. The 4th of July, it, it, it's very, it's always nice for one day to just sit back, even for five minutes, and just, you know, celebrate the fact or be grateful for the country that we live in, this wonderful place in which dreams really can come true. This might be the only country in the world where I could be doing what I'm doing because of the publishing industry, because of the opportunity. So a bunch of different holidays. I'm not really a big holiday person. Mike. What do you think of self-publishing? Wow. I know some people um, who are exceptionally successful in self-publishing. And I know some people who never sell a book. I think it's wonderful that there are now avenues and vehicles available for people who have been turned away by this monolithic publishing industry, which because of the economy, because of the loss of borders, because of the loss of all the mall bookstores, 
There are just not as many books being published by the big publishers anymore. And they're gravitating more and more toward the big names. It's almost impossible, if you're not already a best-selling author, to become one. How do you do it? Because there aren't as many bookstores stocking your book, and Barnes & Noble is taking less stock. They're not reordering. They're only ordering 30 days out. They're only ordering a 30-day supply. And the only books really doing well are the ones that you walk in and you see they're discounted. Then you have everything else. So I think self-publishing is, is a viable option. Um, unfortunately, it disguises the fact that the book that you're that someone self-publishing maybe didn't get bought because it's not very good. So I would urge all people who want to be involved in self-publishing to get an editor. Get an editor. Get someone to make help you make it better because you're not going to be able to do so on your own. We have Thriller Lover's back. Let's see if this is as good as the last few Thriller Lover questions. Have you, ha have you had any interesting fan encounters? Do people say crazy things to you? Boy, that's a great question to which I will give a boring answer. Not really. And I, and I think the reason for that is I'm not a celebrity author. I'm not Lee Child. I'm not Sandra Brown. I'm not R.L. Stein. You know, I'm not someone that people necessarily make a special trip out to see at a book signing. Um, so I haven't really had the kind of experiences that some of my contemporaries have had. Um, and that's the great thing about being a writer. Let me answer the question the best way I can, which is to quote the great actor Richard Burton, who said if he ever had to come back to life, he'd want to come back as a novelist because you're only famous if you tell people who you are. I, I, you know, I, I think that's a great way of putting it. You know who's back? It's Tiny Book Monkey. Would you ever write a book about vampires? That seems to be the go-to topic these days. Great. Here's the thing. If you are catching on to a trend and imitating a trend, you've jumped on the bandwagon too late, almost invariably. If you want to write a dystopian futuristic novel because Hunger Games did so well, chances are by the time you do it, there'll be a hundred others like it. I don't write par supernatural. I don't write paranormal right now. So vampires would be kind of out for me. I, it would be hard for me to weave in the mythology of vampirism. And you know what else? I don't even know what a vampire is anymore. When I grew up, vampires were ugly, smelly creatures with bad teeth. And now they're incredibly hot guys and girls who can go out in the sun, who can be shot and staked and everything else. And if they're wearing a certain ring on Vampire Diaries or Twilight, they can survive. And werewolves and vampires get along. When did the mythology change so much? When did the rules just get start, you know, start getting, you know, that, rewritten. Now here's the thing. Vampirism was always inherently sexual. What shows like Teen Wolf for Werewolves and the Vampire Diaries, the Twilight series have done is they've taken that sexual metaphor to another level. Vampires are sexier than mortals. You know, boy, I know I, you, you, some kid looks in the mirror and he, and he or she's great looking. They go, wow, if I become a vampire, I'll look like this forever. I'll never die. Of course, you don't think of all the other stuff that will go on. But so no vampires in the future uh, for my books, I don't think. That could change. Uh, but right now, I mean, I didn't see the movie or read the book Ab Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. But if I were going to do vampires, I would do it either that way or I would do it that you, somebody you may think is a vampire. For example, in Vengeance of the Tao, the book opens with the discovery of what might be the entrance to hell itself. The use of mysticism or potential mysticism has been a staple of the thriller forever. But... It's still a thriller. It's not paranormal. 
We're now going to go back to Jags Otter. What was the most recent movie you saw in theaters? Wow. I have a friend who has two six-year-olds. I think it was some kid movie. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was uh, Hotel Transylvania. I have not seen. Instead of talking about that, let's talk about the movie I, I'm, I'm going to see next. I can't wait to see Skyfall. As I said before earlier in the show, I grew up on the James Bond movies with Sean Connery. And what from what everyone is telling me, this is a throwback to Goldfinger Thunderball from Russia with Love. The best Bond movies ever. The early ones. And now we're back. And if Daniel Craig is, is, has finally become Sean Connery, I'll be very happy. We have another question from Andrew. Andrew Mazzy or Mazzy. What the, does the future have in store for the McCracken series? That's a good question. The future we start tomorrow is publication day. That's where we start. And we hope that there is interest and cre- and enough sales impetus to give me the creative inspiration to come up with another idea. Because the greatest creative decisions I've ever made are based on financial and economic realities. If Blaine McC- if Pandora's Temple becomes a New York Times bestseller, I will be so inspired to write another one. But if Blaine McCracken doesn't sell well, it would be very difficult to vote- motivate myself to write another. Do I have an idea for the next McCracken yet? No. If I found out it was a New York Times bestseller next week, I'd have one within days. How does that happen? I don't know. But I know it does. Ah! Book Trib is chiming in. The votes are in. And we have a tie for the role of Blaine McCracken between Tommy Lee Jones and Harrison Ford. Well, I promised you I'd give you my choice. No one guessed my guy. Well, let me get to it this way. Die Hard 4, which is set in Moscow, comes out in December. And my choice to, I think it's December, my choice to play Blaine McCracken is Bruce Willis. I think he has everything and always has had everything that I envision McCracken to be and possess. I think Tommy Lee Jones could do it. Um, Tommy Lee Jones could do anything. But I, I think, I'm not sure about Harrison Ford. I think Harrison Ford might even be a little too old now. I mean, I think, but I could see him playing McCracken and his name did come up a few times back in the old days. Um, but as I think about it, either one of those would be terrific. Um, I could see Tommy Lee Jones with McCracken's dialogue. I could see Harrison Ford. Um, but I'd still take Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis sells this kind of movie to me better than anybody. He always makes you feel that he believes in the character he's playing. I'm not sure that's true with Harrison Ford. More true of Tommy Lee Jones. And, and that's why I, I would want to bring in, you know, that's why I find Bruce Willis to be the most appealing thing. And, you know, I'm going to be honest. To me, um, you know, we're looking at, 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 you know, Sony Pictures has optioned my Caitlin Strong series for a television series. Sony Pictures, so, you know, Sony Television. And what excites me the most about that, in addition to, to seeing my, my vision realized on screen, little screen as opposed to big screen, is that it will do, it will energize the books. So many more people will discover the books if there's a television show or a movie. If it's good, if it lasts, even more people will discover the books. Because the thing about being an author like me, a non, I'm not a household name, I'm not a New York Times bestseller, but I'm still hungry to become those things. The problem is, and it's time, it's confession time now. We have, we, we saved confession time for the last five minutes of the show. I'm running out of roots to get to that magic thing, the New York Times bestseller. You know, I've been close, but I haven't done it. But here's the great thing. Pandora's Temple could do it. 
my sequel to The Seven Sins, which I'll be writing next, could do it. I'm doing a book with the great Heather Graham for my, for, you know, for my company tour, which is a tie-in with NASA, which is quasi young, a quasi-young adult kind of crossover story. That could do it. I've got, you know, some nonfiction projects. Here, the key for me is never give up. I don't get angry. I don't get depressed. I get more driven. I get more obsessed. I get more passionate instead of just giving up. You know, I'm not someone who quits easy. Book Trip's got to, has to chime back in. And you know what? Mike Malley has won a set of five Blaine McCracken ebooks. Mike, email booktrib at booktrib.com. Book tri that's booktrib, book, T-R-I-B, one word, at booktrib.com <coughs> with your mailing address, actually your email address. Because what we'll do is we'll email you the ebooks, And also, let me know what format you read in if you read E. If you don't read E, you'll be challenging me to find hard copies of the books to make sure that we get them to you. But my guess is you do read electronic format. Let me know if you're a Kindle guy, an Apple guy, a Nook guy, um, and we'll get them right out to you. Um, isn't it easy? E is a wonderful world. I love it. Uh, I think Book Trip is telling me we're done. They're telling me. Thanks for coming. We had a great time. Well, I love this kind of thing. I love interacting with you. Because here's the bottom line. And here's how we'll finish. I don't know how many of you are out there tonight. But without you, I'm nothing. Without you, there's nobody out there to buy my books. And I have no purpose as a writer. So I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you for asking great questions and participating. And I hope you'll come visit me again. At a at book trip when I when I have a, another McCracken book out in the very near future. Thank you. Come back. Read Pandora's Temple and write me at www.johnlandbooks.com. <laughs>